and hello everyone uh good morning good afternoon good evening from wherever you are uh i'm kulawat from bangkok yeah and, and i'm come on and welcome to fly levels pocket guide uh, let me share the screen you can see the screen all right okay perfect so this is the session will be about do's and don't tips about flight levels. Uh, okay, just a little bit more about us. Uh, we are our coaches from uh, Leaning Consulting from Bangkok, Thailand. We also are certified flight level guides from uh, Flight Level Academy. And also we are the co-founder of uh, Agile 66. It's the biggest Agile community in Thailand. So, uh, We've been around for quite some time, but uh, we are glad to be here again. We we attend the Lean Agile Global last year, and glad to be here again. Okay, so let's begin. So the session is a pocket guide, so we're not gonna dig deep in details, but uh, we have we just want to mention a little bit about what fly level is uh, in this book. And we also honor the other of the books is also in this session, Mr. Klaus Leopold. He talked about uh, fly label that it basically um, look at the organization in the three level of decision making. If you fly really low, you see the details of the operational level. If you fly really high, you see the big picture of the strategy. But often in the organization, there's a missing link between these two levels. Uh, it's the coordination between teams and the coordination between the strategy and the operation and how to make all these links work. That's what Flyable is all about. If you want to learn more about Flyable, uh, the good news is right now, in addition to the book, there are also an online class you can see the lovely face here of the Klaus and the keynote speaker of today, uh, Cliff Hazel. It talk about uh, how you get started with flight levels. But again, the talk today is not, we're not gonna explain what flight level is, but we're gonna talk a little bit about our experience and tips about do and don'ts that with what we experienced so far on the field, it'll be our secret sauce. Okay, flight level have five activities. Uh, visualize the situation, create focus, establish agile interactions, measure progress, and to the loop up, op operate and improve. So we start, let's start with the first one, uh, visualize situation. So in most of the case is building the board, right? Uh, why, why do we build them? They're, one of the key benefits of, of building uh, a board is that it, it can be a real-time status, which would help us eliminate the status update meeting because you can look at the board at any time. And it will surface the problems, even be, it might be the one that you constantly be avoiding, but you cannot hide anymore. The boss will uh, just bring it up. It can help you focus if you want to focus on something or anything, put them on the board and you leave everything else behind. And what I like about the most about having the board, it's almost, it's almost like a tourist attraction in your company. People come to check it out. You know, you can, uh, it usually generate curiosity. People are curious about what are you doing and it can use as a marketing tools even. You know, at one time there was a, uh, a client that, that we implement and uh, if we just start doing Agile and the, the CEO himself, he doesn't even know much about Agile, but then there's a company from Japan visiting his company. He just give us a tour, give, give the, these guys a tour and just bring them to the board and say, oh, we're doing Agile. So it helps. <laughs> no, no, they, they, they told them that they're doing Kanban, no, no, Kanban with the Japanese and, and, and all, all those Japanese just, just bow down and hold. Oh, right, right, something like that. And yeah, thanks. Okay, let's start with the first tips. 
don't do it for them. So, um, you know, as a a few years ago, as we were still young and you know, as a young agile coach, we often go there to a client side and help them design their board, you know, with the hope to fix the problem. And but we learned the hard way that, you know, people need autonomy. Building a board for them is almost like forcing a process to them. They can either do two things, either keep finding the reason why it doesn't work for them, or they just accept it and use it at ease and never think about improving it. So it doesn't work either way. Mm -hmm. Even though we, we have learned this for some time, we, we still miss something. Recently, about a month last ago, week. Oh, last week, okay. Yeah, we, we got invited by, by a new client and the, the head of the organization told us that they want a quick result about this and they are open and ready for the change. So just uh, tell them what to do. And we were too naive to do that. Yeah, and we, we decide all the boards and process for them. And in that workshop that, that we present this new way of working to them, they, they come back and debate and fight back about this. They try to point out that which part doesn't work for them and which of their current work process, uh, work, way of working that they are doing is work just fine. And then I, I, it, it's, it's been like four hours and a half uh, keep talking about this until I need to remind them that we were there because they want to improve themselves. And this is the, the chance that they, they could do it. And we need to schedule another meeting about this to, to come up with their, their, their own framework. So this is kind of the real secret sauce that if we uh, try to do it for them, it, it will be a hard time for you to persuade them to do it. But if we just help them to come up with their own framework, with their own ideas, they, they will be happy with it and they are able to improve it in the long run. So be a coach, not a consultant. Exactly. Next one. Uh, you know, the, the debate between uh, physical board and electronic board has been with Agile from, for a really long time. And, you know, with the current pandemic and everyone working from home, we might all think that, you know, the obvious choice is electronic board. But you know, from our experience, we're still saying that do start with physical board. The, the reason being is that you know, when, when the team start, they, they need to learn and also uh, engage and, and own the process. So imagine if you start a Jira project and give it to the team, do you think they will even think about improving it? Even though they want to, it will be very difficult to change something, right? So oftentimes electronic board come with uh, some sort of restriction or it's not easy to change, but having something like a physical board, you can easily add the columns, you know, add swim lane, design a color coding quite easily. But, but the real deal is that once the team start to exploring, they start to own it a little bit more and more and it's become their own board, not the board that someone else decide for them. Yeah, there, there was a client that, that we, when we came in, they, they told us that they already bought Jira and they, they want to use it. So we need to spend three months training them, them how, how to configure Jira and, and train the, the staff to use that, that software. And, and in the end, when they need to implement their, their own framework, they got stuck because Jira doesn't support that functionality. So they need to tweak it and bend their framework to support Jira instead. So I, I, I'm not saying that electronic tool is bad, but it's not a good start for you. So since then we, we change the strategy. We start with the physical board. They, they just do the post-it notes and, 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 and the whiteboard and it worked just fine until they are, have been a good grip of it and they, they want to move on to the, the, the electric board. They, they have a good idea which functionality, which features they want to their, their software and they select it accordingly. 
Oh, I, I forgot to mention that if you have any questions, you feel free to put in the chat and we will take it uh, at the end of, of the talk. Uh, you might wonder, you know, this pandemic time, how can we even be together and use the board? So uh, something like Miro or even PowerPoint works quite well as well. <laughs> so just something that close to the physical one, not, mm -hmm. not the electronic one that has full feature. The next one is, uh, use some preprint form for a story for a card like this mm -hmm. um from our experience we we learned that in something like fire level two where a lot of people coordinate especially in a big organization there's a lot of people comes and go new people joining the board every day uh, no, every, every often so, so yeah. there's a quite a learning curve if uh you need to know how to use the board so imagine there's a sticky note that you cannot even read what is it about and a lot of time like key information missing and small issue like this can become pretty you know uh, chaotic when a lot of people are involved mm -hmm. so having something like this really help uh, cut down the learning curve yeah in in the beginning we we used the uh, uh, vanilla post-it notes on on the board and and it's quite messy and until we we found out about this idea from, actually it's not our idea. One of our, of our client designed this pre-printed form for themselves and, and they keep adding some, some fields, some information that they need on the board. And it worked very well. We, we got this idea and tried to implement it for every site that, that, that we work with. And it worked pretty good. And uh, it's look more professional to the bosses too. So, so this is a good way of implementing the card on the board. It's always good to have something nice to look at. Mm -hmm. The next one, um, you know, as we all know, uh, a Kanban board will never be a Kanban board without a whip limit. But our experience, uh, we learned that if we, a lot of time when we write the whip limit on the board, right? It's kind of freak people out. Maybe because the word limit, you know, because the fact that they they let the, do they have to reject the work or something, and so we try to do the alternative where don't why don't make it so explicitly. Yeah. You know, a lot of time we what we do is we design the board uh, by calculating the space exactly. Let's say we want to limit it to eight. So in this area, there wouldn't be no longer than eight cards. So once there's a, a card is full and they have to put more cards on top of it, they will, they will become more reluctant because it will look not pretty. It will look, become ugly and it's more like kind of, we call it kind of psychological whip limit to make them aware that this is too much. Yeah, we, we discovered this technique when, when we were doing Scrum. And I have read a book about Toyota TTS and, and learned about whip limit and want to implement it. At that time, we, we didn't know about putting the number on the board and, and respect that, that policy. So, so I, come, I came up with, with this technique that we limit the space on the board and ask everyone to overlap, don't overlap the cards on the board. And it worked pretty much fine until we learned about putting the number on the board and try to implement it and it was chaotic so we went back to to this technique and and it is people uh from from the the reluctant about setting the whip limit on the board yeah okay so the next activity in fly level is uh, create focus you know according to many agile gurus uh whip, whip limits are awesome reduce you know cycle time reduce cost of delay increase productivity and you name it there's a lot of good stuff mm -hmm. and it even have mathematical proof but what we're going to say is don't use it mm -hmm. well it, if you understand why web limit works you know why little loss work you know how what is the con uh, theory of constraint good for you as a coach right but in, in the real life implementation, we found that it's really, really it's one of the hardest concepts for people to understand. 
and sometimes it's backfire. Yeah, yeah. So, someone told me that. Oops. Someone told me that the VIP limit is a secret of the universe. Only two percent of the people can understand it. So it's safer to don't say about it or use it at all. It makes people panic. I remember that that there. I implement this uh, Kanban concept with, with the engineering team, the, the, the implementation team. And one day in our meeting in front of the board, 40 people from the sales department came in with the angry faces and tried to ask why we reject the work that they just won the big contract from their customer and they cannot give it to the engineering team because of the whip limit. And all the engineers told them that this is from the, the agile coach. It's the agile of working. So I need to explain the, this concept to those 40 people for like two hours and they didn't get it at all. At, at last, we need to bump up the whip limit to like from five to 40 to please them. So they, they're happy and go back and wait for six months to clear all those whip on the board. So don't use it. Also don't prioritize. We, this might shock a lot of people, but um, when you start learning Scrum or, or Agile in general, we, we learn to prioritize. You know, as a product owner, you uh, stack rank your product backlog, right? And, but one thing that we found is that once you start grow your backlog, you had a lot of work to do to keep them in a nice order which also give the false impression that you get, every, you get everything all the way to the end. And in a way, this is kind of big planning upfront all over again. Yeah, once upon a time, I, I was a, a little scrum master working closely with the product owner. And we had 200 items on our backlog. And I, I tried to persuade him to remove some unimportant items from the board, so it's manageable. But he, he was reluctant to remove it because he don't want to miss something. So one day in the middle of the night, I sneak in because at that time we, we used the physical cards like for, for, for the user stories. So we, I sneak in and stole some of the items on the bottom of the product backlog and throw it away. And since then, several months, no one asked about those missing cards. So um, I was happy with that. So yeah, this, this teaches us that uh, we don't need to keep everything on the backlog. Actually, we should just keep the important thing in the backlog. So what do we do? We can use something like bet. You know, it's, we, we think that it's an easier analogy to understand. You know, if, let's say if you go to a horse racing, you're not gonna bet on every single horse, right? You're gonna bet on some of it that you think it will win. So people, it's a lot of people, I think one of the analogy that a lot of people in the world would understand. But it, at the end of the day, you know, the new priority always come and the top one is all keep changing and that's what life is. So we will bet on just some of the valuable items on the backlog and throw the rest away. The next activity is uh, establish uh, agile interactions. So what are agile interactions? Well, it's not a normal meetings simply because, well, I, I would say most of the meeting in the corporate world right now is about status update, right? But agile interaction is all about making decisions. So obviously you need to define what decision to be made and then made them. So if you don't have a decision maker to come to this uh, agile interaction, it's might as well, you know, cancel it because it, it's not worth having it. And it also uh, happened in the regular intervals. So you can keep the rhythm. One of the first tips is don't do Scrum so strictly. Uh, I know we have a, a Scrum.org is a, a sponsor of the conference. Sponsor. But, 
I, I I didn't mean well. Don't get me wrong. Scrum it's a good method, right? We've been using it like for ten years. But what we learned, what we also learned is that you know if you look at the a team level uh, events like uh, having a sprint, planning every sprint, sprint retro every sprint, it's a good sprint. I mean a good cadence for the team. But if you look at an uh, an event like a product demo, sometimes it doesn't work as a, like a team cadence because it involves a lot of external stakeholders and they don't work in sprint, right? And then they're not, if you, if you ask them to come to see your demo every sprint, maybe it's not, it's too much for them. They have their own kind of, you know, cycle and might work in different cadence. So if you look at this from five level point of view, it's actually two level. The team level is in the, uh, the, or the sprint uh, cadence is more like in the team level, but the product demo, it could be, in a coordination level because you coordinate with a lot of parties. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when, when, when I come into the, the new client office, they, they ask me which framework should we use, Scrum or Kanban or, or what else, please suggest that. And, 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 and they, they hold it like a dogma, like, like a Bible, try to do everything that is written on the Scrum guide or, or on the, the book that they use and it doesn't work that way. They need to come up with their own framework. They, they can borrow some practices from, from those uh, uh, popular framework like Scrum or Kanban or what else. So, so I, I try to persuade them to come up with their own framework, come up with, with their own way of working by borrowing some of the practice that just works for them. Uh, this one is kind of related to the previous one is that you don't need to have uh, the interaction as a fixed interval. You know, when you start practicing agile, it's good to have the rhythm so you can practice, right? If you, you don't usually postpone the daily sign up because not, you don't have everyone. You want to keep the rhythm. But for some other activities, like again, the product demo, it's not worthy to have a demo to you to if you don't have a key stakeholder showing up, you don't really get any feedback, mm -hmm. right? So you might as well postpone it or make it work somehow when you get all the mm -hmm. key stakeholders. Yep. So, so if, if it doesn't make sense to have it every sprint, we can make a new cadence or new pace for that interaction. For example, you might have a product demo every two sprints or monthly, that's okay. You are not sinful, not following <laughs> some guy. Okay, the last, uh, oh, I think we- Number four. Up a little bit. Yeah. Measure progress. We often ask by our client, you know, how do we measure the progress of our agile transformation? Is there any maturity model out there that we will recommend? Um, you know, there's a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, useful metrics out there and a lot of people discuss, but at the end of the day, we think it's not so useful to measure how agile you are. That is not the point. So eventually we tell the clients that use the current business KPI that you have because that's what agile is about. It is, it's a mean to an end. You support, that's what you use agile for, not to be agile, but to improve something, to improve your business. Yep, go on. And also <laughs> don't use OKR. Like, like Agile, you know, OKR has become another buzzword. If you look in Amazon, there's already like 300 books about OKRs. And when, when there's so many books and a lot of people already read it and they have their own thinking of what ideas, the, the, their own ideas of what the subject is about. So just stick, I mean, go back to just, you know, long, medium, short term goals would, would be enough. Okay, I keep going. The last one is operate and improve. This is our <laughs> three secret sauce, right? You know, um, well, we the, someone was what was say to me that uh, the management is one of the uh, saddest people in the organization because they don't have opportunity to learn. They're so busy all the time. Their schedule is so booked up mm -hmm. and they don't have a schedule to do some of the training. But on the, 
on on the other hand, you know, if you're an agile coach, you know that these are the people that need to be trained the most. They need to have the understanding on how would how would they support agile, how would they make the impact, mm -hmm. right? But you, it's hard for them to 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 get mm -hmm. them to even come to your training. So what do we do? In our case, we yeah. just do the report status update weekly. But yes, it's it's kind of a, a management training in disguise. So we it's, it's kind of we, we report the progress of their subordinate on agile journey. But actually, this is the good opportunity that we educate them on agile way of working, and they don't really know about this until they already learn about it and be agile by themselves. And this is the, the sustainable way that we can retain the agile in the organization. Next one. The best, pro the best process is improvable process. You know, the, a wise guy once said that it's all just the latest state of misunderstanding. You know, you the process that you have right now if it if you you know six months and you still have the same process you might be doing something wrong the process itself needs to keep evolving mm -hmm. I, I i was working with, with with a company and three years later i came back to that company and they're still working the same way that they did uh, three years before and i was really sad about that because they didn't improve at all. So if you're doing something good, the result is good, keep trying looking at the point that you can improve bit by bit. The last one, um, this is one of the, well, the, the question that we got asked the most when, when we roll out like the new agile implementation, people would come to us and ask, am I doing it right? You know, is it, can we do this? Can we do that? Is it a bit good or bad right when so because when, when you learn new things you often want to know um, i'm doing the right thing right i'm on, on the right track but the 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 answer that we like the most and we often give to them is that there's really no agile police to give you the ticket even you're doing good or bad right the right agile is the one that works with that we like to conclude the, the talk, right? We have two minutes left for the question. If you are interested in Fly Level, you can go look up the Fly Level Academy website and, and there's a lot of Fly Level guides can help you. So thanks for joining us. Do we have any Thank you. question? Sorry, I didn't have- uh, Kula, uh, Well, Kula, but there was a question uh, in the beginning at 12.40. Let me just have a look at it. Um, uh, this one was from Stephen Holt. Uh, any tips on having a physical board with up to 50% remote team members? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think, is, is, he still, is he still there? Yeah, he, he raised his hand. Yes, I saw. Okay, yep. Yeah, uh, use the electronic tool that close to the, the physical one. For example, about last week, we, we tried to create a physical board electronically by using Mira. So, Miro. so it's Miro, so, so, sorry, it's the hybrid between Mira and Jira. <laughs> okay, uh, so we, we create a our, our, our white frame and try to draw some box on it, like for, to, to be a Kanban board and use the note, the, the, the with the text note on it, like a, a, the, the, the item card. And this, it works just fine. We, we don't need the, the framework or, 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 or the complex tool over this. Just use it as a physical one, but online. Well, you bring it up because I, I was the one who set up the board for them. And actually in Miro, there's a Kanban app or whatever you call it that you can plug it in. I was trying to use that, but it, it's still not, not at least to me, it's not flexible enough for, for a first time learner, right? Because if you just use something like a sticky card, you can create this, you know, like the pre-print form that we talk about, like the template that you want, and it's much more visible of what you want to show. So uh, 
So just try to make it as close as physical board as, as possible and it would help with, with the first time learner. All right. Hope, hope you got your answer. We got, what do we do if we run out of time? Uh, so uh, we do, we can run a bit over time because we have a 45 minute uh, break, mm -hmm. break oh, after okay. this. Good. So if you do still want to answer, there was one question from uh, Jennifer Cole. Uh, regarding getting rid of the w, uh, WIP limits, what would you suggest as alternatives? Okay, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's already in, in the talk, right? First, first yes, thing, she's in we, the talk, yeah. yes, we, we, we can, Im no, the first one, we can implement WIP limit, just don't say it out loud. Okay, we, we can, uh, can uh, was it allocate the space on the board that that's small enough to limit the number of cards for for that column, right? This is one way of limiting the the, the whip the, the the work in process, and and another one is uh, using the bets. So in instead of limiting the work, we li limiting the starting point. So instead of trying to build a big product backlog with, with multiple items on it. We, we ask them, what is the bets that you want to do within this time frame? It, it may be one, two or three items. And when we achieve those, we, we can add more. So it, it's just, we implement it, but don't say the word. The, the whip limits is kind of stable word. If you say it, people will be panicked. But if you don't say it, you can implement it secretly. I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we will admit it's definitely good, but don't expect any, everyone to understand it. And they don't have to understand it to use it. 